If you have your Bibles, if you want to go to Revelation chapter 2, we are going to look at the last two churches tonight, Smyrna and Philadelphia. But as you turn in there, just a brief recap, we looked at Ephesus and Sardis and how the legalistic and liberal spirits can affect the church and affect the whole. We looked at Pergamum and Thyatira and how the Jezebel spirit can influence false teachers and false prophets and how the Ahab spirits let them do it and don't ever challenge them or anything like that. Last week, uh, we looked at Laodicea and we looked at the spirit that was affecting that church, a seed. A lot of people may not know that much about it. Um, we covered it pretty good last week, uh, so I encourage you, if you haven't seen it or what here, to go back and watch that. There's a lot of really good information about that spirit. But basically, that spirit likes to play mind games with us and get us focused on all sorts of other stuff except for what the Lord wants us to do. So we put on our blinders or we just go to sleep and we stop focusing on the things that God wants us to do. And there were several examples that I gave where you could see that spirit at work through the scripture. One of the parables that Jesus gave was the wheat and the weeds that got sown in the wheat. And like I said last week, from that parable, we can see that it was the enemy that sowed the weeds, but it was only after the servants fell asleep. So that spirit was responsible for that. That spirit gets us focused on any other thing that it possibly can, so that we're not focused on the Lord. We're not growing. We're just going through the motions. And there was something interesting about Laodicea. Jesus had nothing good to say about that church. Nothing. There was no commendation whatsoever for that church. But it was because of that spirit and the way they were hidden. So Ephesus and Sardis, Thyatira and Pergamum had already dealt with that spirit, put their blinders on, and ended up letting other spirits come in and turn them even further away. And Laodicea was on that path. He was trying to get their attention. But now with Smyrna and Philadelphia, we'll see another interesting thing. But first, uh, any boxing fans? Spit not the new boxing, because it's not really as popular as what it used to be, but like the older boxing, like with Ali and Joe Frazier, and even as early as Mike Tyson, like those guys, like back when, really, really good. No fans? <laughs> okay, well, if you were, if you're, and even if you're not, like, those guys got in the ring for an unknown number of rounds and they slowed it up, just back and forth, back and forth. And they had to be really, really in shape to do that. So they trained and they trained and they trained. And then we would get the pay-per-view event or whatever big event and we would get to watch them. So something we'll see is these two churches and how they trained. So let's, let's jump into this. Uh, so we'll see Smyrna in Revelations 2, verses 8 through 11. And it says, And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. 
Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So a little shorter for this church, but you'll see there's no rebuke in there. He had nothing bad to say about the Spirit. And if we look at Philadelphia, Philadelphia is in Revelation 3, and it's verses 7 through 13. It says, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you, since you have kept my command to endure patiently. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave me. I will write on them the name of my God in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has an ear, let them hear the Spirit says to the churches. So Philadelphia was a little bit longer than Smyrna. But again, we see a couple of similarities. There's no rebuke. He had nothing bad to say about that church. And we also see him mention the synagogue of Satan. These people who claimed to be Jews, but they weren't. And they were going against both of these churches and persecuting them and trying to get them shut down and just all the normal things that the enemy throws at the church. But they did have some commendations. They did have some good things that Jesus pointed out in these letters. So in Smyrna, we see that in chapter 2, verse 9. It says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So the first part of that is their commendation. He knows their afflictions and their poverty, but they're rich. So as material things in the world go, they were poor. They didn't have a whole lot of money, didn't have a whole lot of resources. When he says that you are rich, they were spiritually rich. They kept their eyes focused on Jesus all the time. They followed everything that they had available as far as all the written gospels that they had available at the time, they followed it and they stayed true to the word. So for Philadelphia, we see that in chapter 3 in verses 8 and 10. It says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. And verse 10 says, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So they have kept his word, they did deny his name, they endured patiently. Those are things I would love for Jesus to be able to say about me. You kept my name, you did endure patiently. Sometimes I do struggle with that, though. I'm sure we all can say that. But, again, Philadelphia, 
the gospel that they had, they followed. They stayed focused on Jesus. No matter what was going on around them, no matter what the enemy was throwing at them, they stayed focused on Jesus. And when, when I read through this, I hear words like endure and, and uh, afflictions and poverty and stuff. And the first thing I think is Job. That's the first person, if you will, that comes to mind in his story and how he endured what he stayed true. In Job 19, 25 through 27, well into his story, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Wow, right? Job is the oldest written book in the Bible. It doesn't cover the oldest time period. Genesis, Exodus, and those first few books do. But Job was written before those books were written. That even then, Job was looking not to the first coming, but to the second coming. Because he says, I know my Redeemer lives. And at the last, the very end, that he will stand upon the earth. And that I will see him with my own eyes, in my own flesh. I will be resurrected. And I will see him with these two eyes. Y'all will see them with your very eyes that you have right now. Endure patiently. Suffering the afflictions, the poverty, anything that comes at us. Because this, what we see here, as long of a time as we think, 60, 70, 80 years, 90, however long we actually live, is. It's a very, very small blip in the eyes of eternity. Absolutely. So, we say, man, I don't know if I can endure this. I don't know if I can make it through this. <laughs> It's just a short while. Yep. Very short while. So we noted earlier that there was no rebuke. Jesus had nothing to, bad to say about either of these two churches. So that kind of brings up the question. Were these churches perfect? No, they weren't perfect. Matthew 5, 48 says, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He had nothing bad to say about them, so why aren't they perfect? Well, none of us are perfect. But if you're perfect in the eyes of the Old Testament law, that's what Jesus was talking about there. They were following the New Testament covenant under grace, so they would repent when they sinned, things like that. So no, they weren't necessarily perfect, but they did repent and follow what they were supposed to follow. And in Romans 12, 9 through 21, Paul lists the marks of a true Christian. So if we were able to travel back in time and go visit these churches, we would probably see these marks or these characteristics coming out in, of those people. And as we read through these, I think we should really stop and think, do we have these characteristics? Do we exude or emit these particular characteristics? So starting in verse nine, it says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. Is our love for each other really genuine? Or do we just say that we love each other? Do we really abhor what is evil? Verse 10 says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. How often? 
do we actually honor each other? How often do we stop and we thank our senior pastor, Robin, for everything that he does for our church and everything he does in leading us and taking care of everything? How often do we stop and thank the other elders for everything they do? How often do we stop and thank any of the other members for any other place where they serve? Showing on, it can be as simple as thank you for doing what you do. You really make a difference. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Are we really still on fire for the Lord? Do we really show everyone just how excited we really are? Or do we hide that? Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Rejoicing in hope is easy. Patient in tribulation is where we all probably have some trouble. I know I do. Being constant in prayer. Again, that's something I know I struggle with because things in this world happen and it gets my mind going in that direction and I'm not in prayer anymore. I'm not thinking about the Lord. I'm not talking to Him. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So are we donating? Are we giving where we can above our normal tithes? Are we giving those additional offerings? Are we volunteering our time? Because it may not necessarily be just money that could contribute to the needs of the saints. It could be time. It could be additional prayers. It could just be the ministry of presence when someone's here. Just sitting next to them if they're going through a rough season. Showing hospitality is again that's a part of it we should be hospitable towards one another then we get to 14 bless those who persecute you bless and do not curse them there's another tough one and we see when we read about these two churches they had a lot of persecution coming their way but yet they were able to bless those pray for them pray that the Lord moves and changes their heart. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Again, rejoicing is easy. We all like to rejoice. It's the weeping part that we struggle with. That's the part that somebody's going through a rough season and they just need time with people. And it can be just sitting with them. Don't necessarily have to say a word. It can be praying with them. It can be just talking on the phone, man. Different, different needs for different seasons. But that's the part, the weeping part, when it's those rough seasons is where we have trouble helping others. In Ecclesiastes 7, verse 2, if memory serves me right, it says it's better to go to the house of mourning and the house of mirth. Mirth is the rejoicing. It's the happy house. It's the party house. But it's better to go to the house of mourning. And you would think, that seems odd. Why, why would it? Because we go to the house of mourning, we get sad. And the Lord tells us we should be joyful. And one of the fruits of the Spirit is joy. But when we go to the house of mourning, when we sit with people when they're in those tough seasons, it helps us realize that maybe we don't have it so bad. And we may not necessarily have anything to complain about. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Live in harmony. 
Sometimes it's hard depending on the other person. But we should do everything we can to keep peace, to keep things moving forward. Excuse me, it says, never be wise in your own sight. What I do up here, I can honestly say it doesn't come from me. There's no way I can put all these notes together on my own. Some of the stuff that comes out, I have no idea where it comes from. It's not coming from up here. It's got to be the Holy Spirit. I don't claim it. I claim him and his help with all this. So it's not my sight that I'm wise in. It's him. Holy Spirit helps me with all this. So we shouldn't get that pride. It's like, oh, well, look what I'm doing. Well, no. If we're, if we're doing stuff for the Lord, chances are it's the Holy Spirit that's enabling us to do that. So we give that honor where it goes and not... To ourselves repay no one evil for evil but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all so I'm sure we've all heard that saying two wrongs don't make a right don't repay evil for evil if somebody does you wrong let it go forgive them don't let it stay in here you've got to forgive them it says in honorable in the sight of all. So that's not just God's children and other Christians. That's the world too. That's all the unbelievers. Now, some of the folks out there that don't follow the Lord may have a little different interpretation about what is honorable. So we still need to make sure that we're following the word of the Lord by being honorable. But as Jesus says, if someone strikes you in one cheek, give them the other. Don't repay evil for evil. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Again, he says all, not just the brothers, but folks who don't believe as well. Everybody. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So he's, he's going back again to verse 19, never avenge yourselves. So anytime we feel wrong by someone, we, we shouldn't have a, a vengeful attitude. We should... Forgive them, love them. Understand that maybe they are going through a rough season. Maybe they've strayed or something slipped, if you will. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're just 100% evil and I can't have anything to do with them or anything like that. I need to whoop, just completely show them or anything. Forgive them. Try to talk to them if you can. If you can work it out, that's the best route. If you can, and the live peaceably part means, okay, we well, used to stay over there and I'll stay over here and we just, we won't argue or nothing like that. Then maybe that's the route too. But we shouldn't seek vengeance. Again, forgiveness. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Kill him with kindness. Kill him with kindness. Is what he's saying there. Let them come at you. Let them persecute you. Let them say what they're going to say. And just smile. Jesus loves you too. I forgive you. I'm not going to hold that against you. And it will be like heaping burning coals on there. It will just eat them alive. But we're not being vengeful. We're not seeking anything like that. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
Again, just another way to say it, killing kindness. Don't let the evil stuff get to us. Don't let the enemy affect how we react or affect our emotions. But be good, be nice, forgive, be loving and merciful to everybody. Paul goes on in Romans 14 and he gives some more characteristics and some more guidance on how church members, how the brothers should interact. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but do not quarrel over opinions. One person believes that he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So in this passage, Paul is using as an example food. And he goes on where he says, one who eats meat and one who eats vegetables. What he's talking about our conscience and what our individual conscience tells us that we can and can't do. Because in this time, you had Jews and Gentiles coming to the same church. And the Jews still looked at it as, well, you can't eat pork, you can't do this, and a lot of stuff from the Old Testament. And they were trying to force the Gentiles to do that. And it's like, I don't know, these pork ribs taste pretty good to me. I don't, I don't know what's going on about. And some of these churches still had other churches in the area that worshiped false gods. And they would sacrifice stuff to their false gods and then turn around and sell that meat in the meat market. Well, the Gentiles didn't think nothing about it. It was, hey, this is cheap meat and it's good. And the Jews were like, you can't eat that, this demon meat. It was like, but it's cheap. <laughs> so there was a lot of contention over stuff like that. And what Paul is trying to get them to see is whether it's food, whether it's any other issue, as long as it's not crossing the line that God sets for us, then don't force someone else to meet your conscience. So if you're weaker in faith and you say, okay, I can't eat that meat because it was sacrificed to an idol, then someone who says that they can shouldn't force the other one to eat the meat. Because to them, it would be a sin to eat the meat. And then you forcing it to do it have sin as well. And then later in Romans 14, verses 13 and 15, it says, Therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love by what you eat. Do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So he's summing up what I just said. If you're okay with eating meat and your brother's not and you know it, you shouldn't eat meat in front of him. Because you're putting a stumbling block in front of them. You're giving them a chance to violate their conscience. And that's not good. Paul uses the example of food in Romans 14. But it can be anything. We can apply it to anything. So another issue that different denominations different people even within those denominations differ on is alcohol. Some denominations, no, 
not in our church, not in our denomination. Some are like, well, it doesn't say that you can't drink. It just says that you shouldn't get drunk. But we're still going to say no to stop that temptation and stop that ability of going too far. Some are just, okay, well, it says don't get drunk. So we trust that the Holy Spirit's going to lead to you in that. And then let you follow your own personal convictions. So there's, there's different ways of looking at that. As long as we're not crossing God's line, and His line says drunkenness and the loss of self control, then we are allowed to have a drink or two if we want to. But if we know one of our brothers doesn't drink and can't drink because of his conscience, then we should not drink around him. Another issue is types of clothing. Some denominations, you have to wear certain things. You have to wear a dress. You have to wear certain tops if you're a woman, certain length sleeves and all this stuff. But where does it say you'll lose your salvation if you don't? It doesn't. The Lord tells us, all of us, not just women, a to dress modestly. To dress as though you're going to stand in front of him that day. So, would you wear something that highlighted a particular part that would make your brother focus on that and stumble? Because for women, different, different areas of their body attract different people. And there's only two types of men that I know of that don't struggle with lust, and that's dead men and liars. <laughs> All men are going to struggle with it at some point. So, as a child of God, why would a woman want to wear something that highlights those areas that would draw her brother's attention? to those particular areas or wear something that's see-through or something like that that invites those thoughts that's putting a stumbling block and that the same can be said about men as well if they wear something that highlights all their muscles because they work out a lot and all this to get a woman to look at them in that way they're guilty of the same thing another issue is hair and beard styles. Some denominations, when women, you have to have long hair, you are never allowed to cut your hair. Men can't have beards. Where does it say that? That, that you can't. Look, Paul does go on to say, that the stronger Christians, the ones who through their conscience can get a little bit closer to God's line without actually crossing it and sinning, should humble themselves to meet the weaker Christians where they're at. Because we should love them that much. We should want to help them. We should not want to make them stumble or do anything that would cause them to sin. In verse 21 is where he says that it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Anything is a broad category. And you think, well, how can I do that? Because we may not necessarily know everything that you're weak to or that any of us are weak to. But if we know, if we know Brother John over here is weak to alcohol, we shouldn't drink in front of them or they're weak to 
something else. We shouldn't do that with them. If we find out later, like, I didn't know that they were weak to that, and I did that in front of them. We should apologize. We should ask for their forgiveness and all of that for doing that to them. That's part of loving our brothers. So, with this, the churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, if you, if you just looked at that and looked at what they were going through, I think you could reasonably say that they understood they had enough enemies there outside the church, so why would they want to cause any more problems in the church? So it's, it's, it's important that we all remember this and treat each other this way so that we're not causing ourselves to stumble and we can all be united against the world and everything out there. So what's the resolution? What do they need to keep doing? For Smyrna, we find that in Revelations 2 verse 10. It says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. So that last sentence in that verse is what they need to do. Be faithful even to the point of death and they will receive their crown. For Philadelphia, we see that in chapter three, verse 11. It says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Again, we see crowns for both. Philadelphia, he says, I am coming soon. Our time here on this earth, like I said earlier, is just a small blip in the eyes of eternity. In James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Crown of life. I like that. I think it would be cool. But are we ready to die for our faith? Are we ready to stand that steadfast on what we believe. In Philippians 1.21, Paul says, For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If you really think about that, that is a powerful statement. To live here on this earth, we're going to suffer persecution. We're going to have aches and pains and we're going to have Good times and bad times. But it's what comes after this that should excite us. That should help us to get through everything in this life. To die is gain. Because when we leave this world, we're going to be with Jesus. And that's what we should be focused on all the time. So what's the reward? If, there, if people at these churches are able to stand fast and to, to do everything that the Lord says. So for Smyrna, we see that in Revelation 2, verse 11. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Second death. It's all going to die once. Well, for some people there will be two deaths. Because in Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15, it says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is heaven. Plain and simple. In Revelations 21, 7 through 8, 
The one who conquers will have his heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and surface, sulfur, which is the second death. If Jesus isn't our Lord, if he hasn't saved us, if we haven't given our life to him, on that day of judgment, we will experience the second death. But if your name is in his book, if you are following him, if you have given your life to him, you will not experience that second death. And you will be with him for eternity in heaven. But I do want to point something out in Revelations 21 and 7, where in verse 8 it says, The cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. If you go back and you listen to the spirits that affected all these churches, that's the list. That's the list. Cowardly is the Ahab spirit. Faithless is the religious spirit. Detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, Jezebel spirit. Idolaters, liars, covers all of them. If you're not following God, if you're not following Jesus and being led by the Holy Spirit, one of these other spirits, or some spirit that's not of God, is following, is what you're following. And you will not have the fruits of the Spirit. For Philadelphia, Revelations 3.12, it says, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my only name. That sounds pretty cool, to be a part of the temple. That sounds really good. But one of the biggest lessons we can take from this is any time God is moving, any time God is trying to do something, the enemy is going to resist it. It's going to bring a fight. Whether we want to be in that fight or not, we're going to have to fight. So we're going to have to be like the boxers I asked about it at the very beginning. We need to train. We need to be ready. And you can see this all throughout the Bible. If you look at Nehemiah, Sanballat and Tobias were his two biggest opponents. For Elijah, it was Ahab and Jezebel. For Daniel, it was King Nebuchadnezzar and all the various politicians that were named in chapter 6. And for Jesus, it was the Pharisees. We are not immune to this fight. It will come knocking on our door at some point. So how do we how do we get ready? How do we train? How do we stand fast? In 1 Timothy 6:12, it says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. So Paul wasn't telling Timothy, you might have to fight. You will have to fight. As a Christian, we will have to fight. There's no if, ands, or buts. In Jude 3, it says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Contend. It's just another way of saying fight. 
We have to fight. We need to be ready to fight. We don't have a choice. As my shirt says, he just got a lot. We're either on Team Jesus or we're not. If we're on Team Jesus, we need to be ready to fight. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The day is the day of the Lord. But consider how to stir one another up. Do we? Do we really stir one another up? Or do we show up, do a little worship, get a message, and go home? Do we help each other prepare for the week ahead? Do we help each other deal with the week in the past? Stir one another up. Encourage one another. That's one way. Romans 12, 15. We read this a while ago. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We have to be there for each other. We have to be united. And are we willing? Sometimes. Are we really weeping and rejoicing? When the time calls for it. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you, are, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If we see someone slipping, we need to help restore them. Bear each other's burdens, which goes back to Romans 12, 15. Weep with those who weep. Help them bear that burden. Help them get through. We have, again, we have enough enemies and enough things against us out in the world. We need to be there for each other. We need to be unified. Galatians 6, 9 and 10 says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Are we doing as much good for each other as we can? It goes hand in hand with encouraging each other, being there for each other. Now, have we grown tired of doing good? Do we just let someone else take care of it? Do we see a brother or a sister in need and they just, something seems odd. They look down today. I'll let somebody else go talk to them. I'll let somebody else put an arm around them and pray for them. But it may be that the Lord allowed us to see that because he wants us to be that person. Are we doing that? Jude 21 through 23 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear hating even the garments stained by the flesh. Show mercy to the brothers and the sisters. Snatch the unbelievers out of the fire when we have the chance. Show mercy with fear. Give our testimonies. Tell everyone the gospel. Let everyone know what the Lord's doing in our lives so they can be encouraged. So it will encourage them to continue to pray. Continue to come to church. Continue to worship. We need to be there for each other. As the two churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, were. And again, we have enough trouble to deal with in this world. Why do we make it harder on ourselves? We need to stay united under God's name. 
and his authority as a church body. And I know this is the last sermon in this particular series. We've got prayer night next Wednesday, which is going to be another awesome night. Then we're going to look in Nehemiah. We're going to be going to Nehemiah and looking at unity. That's going to be the main backdrop out of Nehemiah is unity for God's people. And we're going to see some very awesome things of what God can do when his people are united. And it's a reminder for us that we should be united. And the way this has worked out, that these were the last two churches and they were united amongst themselves to be able to withstand all of that, to be able to keep going the way that the Lord wanted them to go so that he had nothing bad to say about it. That can be our church. That can be our home. But we have to be united under the Lord's authority and under his kingdom. And I know I have typically ended things with a prayer. But for some reason, I put this scripture down here. I'm not sure why. I didn't know at the time, at least. But I think tonight, I think God, through his word, needs to have the last word. And it comes from Romans 16, verses 17, 17 through 20. It says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.